Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karel Pacak and I was asked by the FIO Para Alliance to present a talk that would focus on some visions and perspectives related to pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. So the title of my talk is New Visions and Perspectives on Pheochromocytoma and Paraganglioma Spreading the Word, Precision Medicine and Globalization. Some results that I am going to present would have never happened without the NIH support as well as collaboration with many scientists and physicians at the NIH as well as outside the NIH. Now I would like to say some few words about definition, localization and basic information related to PPGL. Uh, PPGLs are neuroendocrine tumors that synthesize, metabolize and release catecholamines and their metabolites. Uh, pheochromocytomas are tumors that are located in the adrenal gland and are most common. Paragangliomas are tumors that are outside the adrenal gland and they are commonly found in the abdomen and less frequently in the mediastinum. Then we have also had the neck paragangliomas and they represent approximately 5% of all paragangliomas and those tumors are usually benign and slow growing. Regarding biochemical diagnosis of these tumors, this diagnosis is based on the measurement of catecholamine metabolites, for example metanephrines as well as methoxytyramine in either plasma or urine. These tumors are slow growing with a volume doubling time of approximately 5-7 years. Paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas have the strongest hereditary risk of all endocrine neoplasm and it's approximately 35 to 40 percent. And now all PPGLs are considered to have metastatic potential. Currently metastatic PPGL is defined by the disease presence in bones or lymph nodes and I have to say that there is no cure for metastatic disease. Here I would like to outline some perils from 2022 WHO classification of PPGLs. Pheochromocytoma is a neuroendocrine neoplasm that originates from chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla is now termed as intraadrenal paraganglioma. Paraganglioma-like neuroendocrine neoplasm refer to a subset of epithelial neural tumors and they were renamed. For example, cauda equina paraganglioma was renamed as cauda equina neuroendocrine tumor. Gangliocytic paraganglioma was renamed as composite gangliocytoma neuroma neuroendocrine tumor. The term nodular adrenal medullary hyperplasia was dropped and replaced by microphiochromocytoma. The distinction of a primary paraganglioma from metastasis is challenging and although not 100% accurate, the use of S100 and or SAX10 help in this distinction. For example, metastases are usually negative for these markers. There has been continuing and very successful progress in imaging of these tumors. All started with the introduction of MIBG more than 30 years ago. Later on with the introduction of DOTA analogs and approximately two three years ago with the implementation of alpha emitters as new promising therapeutic options for metastatic uh, PPGL. There is also huge promise that using functional imaging for example, PET scanning can well define tumor from a distance. For example, we can now uh, define the degree of apoptosis, hypoxia, angiogenesis, abnormal glucose metabolism and other tumor dysfunction. As I mentioned before, there is an emergence of alpha emitters. Uh, there are some characteristics of alpha emitters that include, for example, short tissue penetration about 0.1 millimeter, high linear energy, and therefore those alpha emitters can be very efficient at killing viable cells. There are minimal side effects since the, they do not spill over to kill surrounding healthy cells. 
Targeted radionuclide therapies using alpha emitters currently include uh, radium-223 dichloride, which is called xofigo, and it is used for bone metastatic lesions, astatin-211, metaastatobenzylguanidine for neuroendocrine tumors, and actinium-225, dotatate for uh, PPGLs and other neuroendocrine tumors. Here is the example of targeted radionuclide therapy for metastatic paraganglioma using actinium-225 dotatate. 41-year-old male with history of progressive metastatic paraganglioma despite previous treatment with lutetium-177 dotatate and mTOR inhibitor therapy. The patient was subsequently treated with actinium-225 dotatate. Post-therapy scan after three radiotherapy cycles showed significant improvement in tumor burden compared to pre-therapy scan. The study of Ayadav and co-workers summarized results from nine patients with metastatic PPGL treated with actinium-225 dotatate. 50% of patients had partial remission 37 stable disease and overall disease control rate was 87.5 percent. There was no grade 3 to 4 hematologic, renal and hepatic toxicity. Other promising targeted radionuclide therapies include not only somatostatin receptor agonists but also newly introduced somatostatin receptor antagonists. To summarize pros and cons of each group, somatostatin receptor agonists have high affinity to somatostatin receptors, but only to those in active conformations. However, on the cell surface, there are 100 times less somatostatin receptors in active conformations than are in inactive states. Regarding somatostatin receptor antagonists, they have high affinity to somatostatin receptors in active and inactive conformations and slow dissociation from these receptors. High uptake and long retention in tumors despite no receptor internalization. However, they have a higher hematotoxicity compared to somatostatin receptor agonists. The picture shows a patient with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Compared to somatostatin receptor agonist, gallium-68 dotatoc, somatostatin receptor antagonist, JR11, show more le liver lesions before and after treatment. PPGLs uniquely express membrane receptors and transporters that are suitable for their imaging and treatment. For example, they express the norepinephrine transporter or previously mentioned somatostatin receptors, mainly type 2. This serves as the basis for teranostics, the term that was pioneered by Jan van Kauser and now being used for therapy and diagnostics, a treat what has been image approach. For example, iodine MIBG scan and iodine MIBG therapy or gallium dotate scan or lutatera dotate therapy. So how do we choose between the two systemic radiotherapies, for example lutatera and MIBG? If lesions have similar uptake on MIBG and dotatate, it depends on patient characteristics. For example, age, bone marrow reserve, metanephrine levels, insurance type, and other important aspects. If lesions have heterogeneous uptake, it depends on tumor characteristics, for example tumor size, location, growth rate and other factors. For example, scenario 1, a patient with four large liver lesions positive on iodine-123 MIBG scintigraphy and 20 small stable bone lesions positive on gallium-68 dotatate should be treated with iodine-131 MIBG. Scenario 2. A 
patient with two large, stable, necrotic liver lesions, positive on iodine-123 MIBG scintigraphy, and four moderately growing lymph node lesions, positive on gallium-68 dotatate, should be treated with Lutatera. Here are some future promising mechanisms to increase effectiveness of targeted radionuclide therapies. For example, to potentiate effect of radiotherapy, we can use various chemotherapies. To upregulate somatostatin receptors, some epigenetic drugs can be used. We can also increase tumor dosimetry and finally to overcome radioresistance using combination of different radioisotopes. There is a successful continuing progress in biochemical diagnosis and pathology of these tumors. I envision that metabolomics and metabologenomics will become essential in diagnosis and treatment of these tumors. Furthermore, uncovering the role of tumor microenvironment especially the immune system, will result in reclassification or reclustering of these tumors and establish new therapeutic hopes. For example, the study of Goshal analyzed 22 immune cells in pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, and the study identified five immune clusters. And what was interesting that, you know, those clusters were actually associated with some genetic background of these tumors. For example, immune cluster 4 was characteristics of SDH, especially SDHB tumors, and it was associated with metastatic disease. This immune cluster 4 was also associated with much worse uh, survival. Regarding individualized medicine, there are some important future goals and consideration. For example, for immunotherapies to uncover the role of tumor microenvironment. For other therapies and approaches, it will be interesting to study cell membrane targets for future uh, targeted therapies, artificial intelligence, single cell sequencing, cloud computing and big data. We will also focus on tumor microbiome, new experimental models, and it will be very important to establish new cell lines and 3D organoids. Regarding new and future guidelines, for example, SDH careers guidelines has been launched, new SDHD uh, guidelines has been also launched uh, practically this year, and SDHB guidelines are in preparation. We also need to revise previous Endocrine Society PPGL guidelines. Machine learning modeling will become essential for diagnosis and management of these tumors. The study of Pamporaki uh, included 492 patients with PPGL to train and validate machine learning methods to predict metastatic disease in these tumors. 12 PPGL specialists uh, were included. Then clinical features or markers were also used, for example, plasma methoxytyramine, uh, metanephrines, age, sex, previous history of PPGL, location and size of primary tumor, presence of multifocal disease, and also the presence of SDHB variant data. Uh, regarding results, this was very interesting because the best performing model outperformed the best performing specialist. So sensitivity for prediction of metastatic disease in these tumors based on the external validation reached 83% and the specificity was 93%. So this is the first study showing that providing a preoperative approach to predict metastasis in patients with PPGL and thereby guide individualized patient management and follow-up. Precision medicine care may become essential for healthcare professionals as well as for patients. For rare tumors like PPGLs, it will include most important guidelines 
for their management as well as treatment options. Patients will profit from data using cloud computing, but ethical and identity theft will need to be carefully considered. Various organizations, consortia, as well as studies will be paramount to succeed in future. For example, the FIOPARA Alliance with its excellent initiative to establish centers of excellence programs, SDHB FIOPARA Coalition, providing exceptional funding support, and uh, the European Network for Study of Adrenal Tumors and SAT highly supporting studies on PPGL. Rare disease like PPGL needs multidisciplinary collaborations among investigators and institutions from various countries. A global approach is highly encouraged with the goal to defeat metastatic disease. There are some few examples, for example, spread the word among other societies besides endocrine and oncology ones. Further educate other healthcare professionals, for example, including general practitioners, cardiologists, pediatricians, and others. Establish or further support national databases, tumor blood banks, international grants, centers, and joint conferences. Encourage international clinical trials and finally, encourage patients' involvement since knowledge makes you stronger. Finally, with the involvement of young and promising scientists with very high ethical standards, excellent bedside manners, a team mentality, and involvement in professional and patient-oriented organizations, Coupled with a passion for studying rare diseases, we can undoubtedly endeavor to correct the faults in our stars and perhaps even prevent them. Dot often used with reference to various contexts, so to must globalization be fostered on board in the study of PPGL or else I fear we may fail. At the end of my presentation, I would like to thank uh, all the members of my lab, scientists, attendings, fellows and nurses at the NIH for their dedication, passion and long hours of effort towards those who suffer. I also would like to thank outside NIH investigators. Finally, I would like to thank my wife Michaela for her very exceptional support. Thank you so much.